Dr. Stephen Law is a reader in philosophy at Haythrop College, University of London, and is the editor of the Royal Institute of Philosophy journal, Think. Amongst many other books, Stephen is the author of a very short introduction to humanism, The War for Children's Minds, The Philosophy Gym, and Believing Bullshit, How Not to Get Sucked Into an Intellectual Black Hole. Stephen Law has debated many Christian philosophers, including William Lane Craig, John Lennox, and Alvin Plantinga. Our central focus for today is Law's main argument against the existence of God, the Evil God Challenge. The Evil God Challenge can be stated something as follows. Why should we consider the hypothesis that there exists a good God significantly more reasonable than the hypothesis that there exists an evil God? In part one we'll be discussing the Evil God Challenge and in part two we'll be engaging in some further analysis and discussion. Hello and welcome to episode 29 of the Pan Sidecast. I'm Jack Symes and I'm joined once again by Gregory Miller. Hello. And our very special guest, reader of philosophy at Heathrop College, University of London, and editor of the philosophy journal Think, Dr. Stephen Law. Hello. Welcome, Stephen. Thank you for joining us on the show today. Thank you for asking me. So I'd like to start off with a nice and easy question. Uh, so what is philosophy, Stephen? <laughs> right. <laughs> um... <laughs> Well, I'm inclined to think of philosophy as an armchair discipline that addresses conceptual puzzles. And so it has its own sort of distinctive approach then in terms of trying to solve conceptual puzzles. We're trying to think through the logical consequences of our positions, trying to establish whether there really is a particular conceptual obstacle mm -hmm. to holding a certain position and so on. Um, so I don't really think of it as an empirical discipline. Um, it seems to me that, you know, while science is obviously very important and valuable and sometimes scientific insights can provide uh, ammunition when yeah. it comes to philosophical arguments, mm -hmm. um, philosophical arguments are for the most part non-empirical mm -hmm. um, and are engaged with kind of grappling with conceptual puzzles. Okay, so ph philosophy is a kind of armchair discipline, but can we can we learn anything from the empirical sciences uh, in philosophy, do you think? Yes, of course. So, um, I mean, an example would be that where we we argue for a moral conclusion, perhaps combining premises, some of which are sort of a priori or intuitive, and where others are empirically based. So a simple example, terrible example, would be something like, Women should not be allowed to vote because yeah. unintelligent people shouldn't be allowed to vote and women are unintelligent, mm -hmm. okay? Um, clearly, one of those premises there is it can be challenged using science. We yeah. can show that it's not true science. that women are unintelligent and so on. Mm -hmm. So, obviously, yeah, obviously, science can play a role and knowledge of scientific developments can be very important in philosophy. You need to kind of keep abreast mm -hmm. of what's going on. But that's not to say that I think that philosophy is really a branch of empirical science. Mm -hmm. I think of it as a distinct discipline. Having said that, some scientists use the term science in such an elastic way that they are happy to include what I call philosophy under the umbrella of science. So Richard Dawkins, for example, is an example oh, of I did this. not know that. Yeah. So, uh, so I've talked to Richard Dawkins about, you know, what is philosophy and how is it distinct from science? And it turns out that he thinks that, you know, conceptual inquiry, armchair inquiry is perfectly legitimate and proper. And indeed, it does have a role in empirical science. You know, we could look at some examples if you like, but it, you know, it has a role there and it has a role mm. more generally. And he, 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 he just thinks of that as a bit of science, somewhat surprisingly. Uh, well, know, that's good. We've got another convert to <laughs> the philosophical yeah. cause. Yeah. I didn't know that's what, I didn't know Dawkins was. I didn't, because uh, I, he's I'll, usually quite, I would have thought he'd be, he seems to be quite... Well, that's why I asked him. I, I said, look, if this is, this is what I understand science uh -huh. and to be, and this is what I understand philosophy to be, um, 
you know, do you, do you have any time for philosophy then? Because my suspicion is that actually you're rather you you know you're quite dismissive of philosophy. Mm. You, you'd stick it in the same camp as theology, which he compares to fairyology, for example. <laughs> So very r- r- rudely dismissive mm. of theology. Uh, but it turns out that if, as long as you understand philosophy as a kind of con- conceptual a priori activity where we're applying reason in order to try and figure mm-hmm. out things, well, he, he, you know, he's, he's very happy <laughs> for that to be pursued. Great, he yeah. does say things like, but why call it philosophy then? Mm. Uh, well, why not? As far as I'm concerned, yeah. why not call it philosophy? Um, and, um, yeah, he, you know, he, he doesn't have any problem with it. I think that the, when scientists have a problem with philosophy, sometimes, so Peter Atkins, for example, mm-hmm. famous scientist and very rude about philosophy, um, and a friend of mine. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I guess so, <laughs> so he, he takes the view that philosophy is a waste of time because if you want to find out about the world around you, mm-hmm. sitting in your armchair having a good old think is not the appropriate method. You're never going to get anywhere mm-hmm. so far as discovering what the facts are, so mm-hmm. far as reality is concerned. Um, and actually, I have a great deal of sympathy with that view. I'm inclined to think that philosophy cannot tell you anything about how things actually stand outside your own mind Mm -hmm. Um, what you can do though is you can establish that certain claims are not true because they involve a logical contradiction Mm -hmm. for example Um, so and you can make you know progress in terms of showing that whilst there might seem to be a conceptual obstacle to a certain claim being true actually there isn't Mm -hmm. a conceptual obstacle so you know maybe the mind body problem is fundamentally a conceptual problem uh, there seems to be some conceptual obstacle to minds being identical with anything physical. But then perhaps on closer examination, it turns out that what seemed to be a conceptual obstacle isn't actually an obstacle after all, in which case we've made huge progress philosophically and indeed scientifically. Um, but we haven't actually established anything about how things stand out there in the world. We've just established that certain things, certain positions that appear to be conceptually Mm -hmm. incompatible are not actually conceptually incompatible, and that is very valuable. Mm, That is valuable. Uh, And again, like you said, it would be a a significant uh, piece of progress if we uh, solve the mind-body problem. Quite. But on the other hand, I don't... I'm I'm very sceptical about the view that we can, by sitting in our armchairs, somehow gain access to some broader reality, you know, that there's some form of intuition that connects us up to a mathematical realm Mm -hmm. or that there is uh, a sensus divinitatis that allows us a priori to know that God exists, for example, or anything like all of that stuff. I'm very sceptical about. It seems to me that if you want to know what what reality is fundamentally like, uh, you need to observe it, you know, (laughs) by the familiar familiar methods. You've got to get out in the field and measure something. Kind of thing. Yeah, certainly you've got to take a look. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I guess we kind of philosophy is this armchair reasoning, this conceptual uh, exploration, something like this. So, how did you first get into philosophy, Stephen? Um, well, I think I've always been interested in philosophy. Uh, it, you know, as a teenager, I was certainly thinking about philosophical questions i think a lot of teenagers tend to be naturally drawn to the subject it's just that at that time i didn't know that it was a subject yeah um i didn't know that there was this thing called philosophy or if i was aware of the name i didn't understand didn't understand what it covered so i was interested in questions like you know what makes things right and wrong how do i know that this is real and not a dream mm-hmm. uh, could a machine think and so on these these were questions that fascinated me but i didn't realize you could actually go to university and study them <laughs> uh and you know there there was a discipline yeah. uh that that included them um and once i discovered that well that then i knew that's what i wanted to do so i was a postman um at at that time in cambridge and i applied to, i didn't have any a levels mm-hmm. So I applied to university as a mature student, and the only university that would be prepared to accept me on the basis of the fact that <laughs> I didn't have any A levels but was very interested and you know I could you know I could hold my own in a conversation they interviewed me mm-hmm. they um they admitted me for the uh for the b a Brilliant. Which I, I got a first. Have you read so. any uh, philosophical texts before the BA? Or up until Not, then, was it just these kind of, you know, yeah. musings about kind of... I think I was... So I was a bit of a hippie, and I was reading a lot of <laughs> hippy-dippy yeah. woo crap, to be honest, early on. But then one book leads to another, and eventually I found that I was really just reading 
Western philosophy in one way or another via things like the art of motorcycle maintenance, I think. Yes. So you think that, that, that obviously, you know, gives you a window on Plato a little, a little bit. Okay. And then I, I bought, um, Anthony Flew's massive volume, an introduction to Western philosophy. I think it's mm. called something like that. Mm. Um, which I took around India. Well, before I went to university, I had, uh, seven, about, two or three months, I think, in India, wandering around. And I had this massive book, and I read that. Uh, and I was particularly taken with Plato and the theory of forms early on. Uh, it didn't last very long. <laughs> My, <laughs> well, I'm still interested in it, but, yeah. you know, I don't, I'm, I'm, I don't, I don't believe You're any of that Platonist. stuff. But I know I'm not a Platonist. But I was, at the time, I was very drawn to that, possibly, I think, because I, I really enjoyed C.S. Lewis um, earlier on. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the Narnia books mm -hmm. are hugely influenced by Plato. Yeah, if you read The Last Battle, when they all die <laughs> in a train crash, I think you seem to remember, Pro Professor Diggory is asked and about by, by, by the kids or by somebody about you know, what's going on? And, and he said, Oh, you know, it's all in Plato. What do they teach you kids yet? Yeah. These days, you know, you need to go back to Plato and see what's really going on. Uh, yeah. C.S. Lewis, big, big Platonist. I mean, why is, why, why is the book about him and the, the, the biography called Shadowlands? Uh, good. Yeah. Yeah. Public debates, children's books appearing on multimedia platforms such as our podcast today. And you also edit the philosophy journal Think, the aim of which is to provide accessible and engaging philosophy to schools, colleges, and the general public. Why is promoting the study of philosophy so important to you, Stephen? Uh, well, I enjoy it. And I also, looking back, I can see that, you know, I was really interested in philosophy when I was young, but there wasn't really much in the way of accessible material that I could read and so on. Um, and so I ended up writing my first philosophy book for children, really for myself, as an earlier, you know, at an earlier stage in, in my development. Um, I wrote the book, the kind of book that I thought I would have enjoyed when I was younger, um, because there just wasn't enough of that kind of thing. So that was one reason I did it. There are many other reasons for encouraging people to think philosophically. Um, I think that if you go through life never having taken a step back and asked the bigger questions, you know, perhaps reflected a little bit on some of your most fundamental beliefs. If you go through life only ever thinking about how you're going to pay the mortgage and what colour car to get next and so on, then you're leading a fairly shallow sort of existence maybe that's okay but it, you know certainly i feel that that my my life would be a pretty thin sort of existence mm. without without a bit of philosophical reflection makes it more interesting um and i also think that by reflecting in that way we can become better human beings potentially not always mm. but sometimes um i think that Asking yourself some fundamental questions about why certain things are considered right and wrong, for example, is a very good idea. Um, it's by asking those kind of questions that, you know, some of the most dramatic improvements in the human situation have taken place. You know, well, why was slavery abolished? Why do women have equal rights now? Why are we increasingly concerned with, um, with other species and mm. our moral treatment of them? Because pe some people don't just go with the flow and accept what everyone else believes, but they actually ask themselves some penetrating mm. questions. And so, you, you know, you can make moral progress. And then another, another reason would be that when research was done into the backgrounds of people that saved Jews during the Holocaust, so, for example, there was a couple called the Oliners, Pearl and Samuel, wrote a book, I think, called The Altruistic Personality. They did research into the backgrounds of rescuers of Jews. I think Jonathan Glover has also looked into the backgrounds of people that behaved well and then behaved badly mm -hmm. during various you know, moral catastrophes of the 20th century in his book Humanity. And I think what what, what they're both saying is, what really immunizes people most effectively against drifting into that kind of moral horror is encouraging people to be reflective, to think for themselves and not just passively accept, but to, you know, critically engage and be prepared to question some of their own most fundamental beliefs.
other things too. I mean, having empathy and being being willing to listen and take stock of another point of view. Um, all those things are important. So it seems to me that young people should be, if we want to avoid those kind of horrors in the next century, we need to ensure that we raise people not to be moral sheep, right? But to be autonomous, critical, independent thinkers. That's your best bet mm. if you want to avoid moral catastrophe. So there's a pretty big reason for it's encouraging funny. well it's, it's interesting because <laughs> i literally wrote moral sheep as a follow-up question to what you were, what you were saying here which links nicely in with our, our next one i guess it's kind of a question of two sorts a how how dangerous is it if we're not teaching uh, young people skills in philosophy teaching them philosophy how how pressing is this danger of people becoming moral sheep and second of all how important is i guess it's the repeat of the first in a sense how important is philosophy to a to a child's education I think it's educationally a good idea to get kids to think and question. There are various ways in which you can do it. You know, there are philosophy in schools programs that adopt various different approaches. So, you know, P4C, as it's known, um, philosophy for children, um, takes a particular approach. And then there are other approaches, getting kids together to talk about the big questions where, you know, there's turn taking and Everyone is an equal contributor to the, to the conversation. I think that's a very healthy thing. Sometimes those talking shops can become a bit like a stream of consciousness. There's mm. little sort of rigor uh, to what's going on. There's not enough emphasis on, no, you actually have to make a case mm. for what you believe. It's, this is not just an opportunity to say what you believe. Um, a bit more, a bit more focus on that sometimes would be a good idea. But there's, uh, you know, there's, there's good evidence that if you run those kind of programs in schools, it's very good educationally. I mean, Ofsted reports are now picking up on this and saying, oh, look, uh, philosophy in the classroom, very educationally, very good. There have been various pilot studies around the world, including one in Scotland, Clackmannanshire, where they found that the kids became measurably more intelligent. I mean, six percentage points compared to the control group where schools which did not have a philosophy program. Yeah. So, you know, there are educational benefits of that sort. Um, I've forgotten where we're going with this question. <laughs> I've got a follow up here. From okay. an empirical point of view, the, the state of our political situation, for example, or our education system, what's mm. stopping our philosophy from being taking the role that we think it should in schools? What, what's stopping it from becoming a GCSE, for example? Yeah, there is some resistance to philosophy in certain quarters. So, uh, there's a kind of religious lobby, conservative religious lobby, that is very much opposed to philosophy. They won't say it quite like, they won't put it quite like that, but deep down, that is fundamentally what they're opposed to. And they'll say things like, well, if you let people think, you know, start thinking for themselves, who knows what they're going to end up thinking or believing? You know, we're just, we're opening the can of worms here. It's a very dangerous thing to do, they just would don't say. Don't question it, leave it alone. Uh, well, you know, we'll let them have a little think and a question a bit later on, you know, <laughs> after, after they've had a proper grounding in some sort of tradition of thought which will happen which you know nine times out of ten will turn out to be religious okay mm -hmm. so there's that kind of pressure and i've been talking to teachers recently who have said you know without without me prompting them they've said yeah that's the problem. that's one of the problems that we've got here is that there's a kind of powerful religious lobby um that's pressing uh not to have more of this kind of thought going on in schools because they see it correctly in my view as a threat <laughs> to their own particular religious beliefs. Um, you know, <clears throat> so there's that. It's also, it's difficult to examine, to measure. I mean, you know, it's hard to put a number on it. Uh, you know, it's not just as, you know, it's, you, it's hard to do a multiple choice <laughs> questionnaire when it comes to philosophy. And government ministers like to see that they're getting something for their investment in education. Mm -hmm. And it's very hard to measure what it is that they're getting uh, in any meaningful way when kids do philosophy. It's just, it's not so much that kind of thing. It's not just memorizing a bunch of facts and then you can just test the kids and see where they've actually successfully memorized them. No, you're giving them skills and it can be quite hard to evaluate the extent to which those skills are, are being taken on board and so on. So there's that problem. And then there are other problems too. There is this general sense that if you let kids loose 
thinking for themselves from a young age, you know, we've already seen religious people have this concern, but other people have this concern too. That mm-hmm. Who knows where they'll end up? Aren't you really promoting relativism, you know, <laughs> the view that, well, it, you know, you've got your view, I've got my view, and they're all equally valid, aren't they, really? Isn't that what you're saying, Stephen? Uh, no, <laughs> no, that's not it at all. To encourage independent critical thought is not to suggest that whatever point of view you end up with is equally correct, mm. or that we cannot defend a particular line or make a particular case, you know, for um a particular moral point of view, say. I mean, you can certainly do that, and schools could do that, um, even whilst allowing their kids to think for themselves uh so 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 there are all sorts of reasons why philo- people are suspicious of philosophy in the classroom and i've just given i've just mentioned mentioned a few there are more but we'll stop there so although that we may not be able to get uh, philosophy as you know deeply into the uh, educational system as uh, we may want it um a good place for people to begin to kind of disseminate it uh more widely is having more public facing philosophers uh what stephen do you think makes a uh, a good public philosopher as it were well there there are many ways of being a good public philosopher but mm-hmm. things that <clears throat> um i would emphasize are don't be boring uh <laughs> it's a good message for life yeah <laughs> yeah don't 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 be dull um so try and so one way of avoiding being dull is to is to try and Think about what your audience are going to be interested in, mm-hmm. the kind of questions that they're interested in, and um, maybe m- m- maybe start there. And then, most importantly, I think clarity and precision. So, you know, if it's extremely important that philosophers are not, you know, spouting pseudo profundity and waffling and mm-hmm. so on. And you know, there are some philosophers <laughs> that, are, that are a bit prone to that and that's not doing philosophy any good at all as far as i'm concerned um you know you should not be pretentious Mm -hmm. you should try and be as clear as you can be um you should avoid um wherever you can you know trading on trading on ambiguities and things like that the great risk that you take with clarity is that if you're very clear it can be very clear where you've gone wrong Mm mm-hmm and so you open yourself up to potentially you know, being, being straightforwardly refuted. Whereas if you kind of hedge and you're a bit vague and you switch from this meaning to that meaning and so on, you play, you engage in the kind of sleight of hand with uh, meanings and so on, um, you can create the illusion that you're far more profound than you really are and you can make it extremely difficult for people to uh, criticize what you're saying because they're never quite sure what you're what you're saying so when philosophers engage in that kind of activity um well i'm obviously very disappointed uh clarity should mm-hmm. be top of your list i think often people will um criticize philosophy for being too clear and precise and that is a uh, sometimes what people think makes it dull so the higher in the academic ladder the more clear and precise you should become and the more kind of protracted and uh, uninteresting to the general audience the uh, debates will be so mm. is there not a, some peculiar tension there maybe well uh, i think that uh sometimes by becoming by getting clearer about things concepts and so on Actually, what looked to be terrifically exciting can turn out to be quite mundane. Mm -hmm. I mean, the fact that it looked terrifically exciting is down to the fact that you weren't really very clear about what was going on. So, you know, a famous philosophical puzzle is, you know, can you jump in the same river twice? A puzzle associated with the ancient Greek philosopher Heraclitus. Um, I suppose that what Heraclitus had in mind is something like this, that if you jump into a river Mm -hmm. and then you get out and then you jump in the second time, well, the river will have changed in various ways. The water's moved, the mud's churned about a bit and so on. So it is not the same. Mm -hmm. But if it's not the same river, then the number of rivers that you have jumped into is two, not one. Uh, And now that sounds wrong in fact that sounds extraordinary in fact that means that you know whenever there's any kind of change to a river well there isn't a change it's just replaced by a brand new river and of course another reason that it won't be possible for you to jump in the same river twice is it won't be you Mm. that jumps in the second time and so on so so we we seem forced to accept some quite extraordinary (laughs) metaphysical conclusions there um 
what's gone wrong? Well, let's get a bit clearer about what the same yeah. means, right? There are two kinds of sameness or identity. There's qualitative sameness. You can have two objects that share the same qualities, but still the number of objects is two, not one, right? Uh, so you've got qualitative sameness without numerical sameness. And then you can have numerical sameness. You know, this pen I'm holding in my hand now, I take the top off. It's changed. It's numerically the same pen, but it's not qualitatively the same pen, right? So, so now we've made that distinction, very useful distinction. We can now see that the argument for the extraordinarily exciting conclusion <laughs> that the number of rivers that you jump into, uh, it was a crap argument, wasn't it? It traded on an ambiguity. Yeah. Um, and now we've got the clarity. What looked exciting has become very dull indeed. Yeah. So now you might say, oh, that's just not what I'm after in <laughs> philosophy. Uh, but, um, I, you know, I'll take the truth over exciting bullshit every time. Mm. Um, I value that more highly. Mm. Um, on the other hand, being clear can actually be very exciting, yeah. <laughs> rather too exciting uh, for some people. So um, it might be that by getting clearer and clearer about what our fundamental moral principles are and concerns are, it might become clearer and clearer to us that we are doing things that we really should not be doing we you know we should not be treating other races or other sexes or other species whatever it might happen to be we should not be doing what we are doing there's there's a fundamental problem there and by getting clearer about that we can make huge moral progress progress which is very very exciting uh potentially are uh, also very terrifying or even you know potentially for many people it's going to be very bothersome indeed you know if you're going to you can no longer have slaves um so yeah so so sometimes clarity can be very exciting perhaps rather too exciting for some people um on the on the other hand clarity can also result in something that seemed extraordinarily exciting mm -hmm. turning out to be really very dull indeed but um that's okay it's still progress Yes, I guess it is. So, thank you. A final question before we move on to the evil God challenge. A lot of your work has been focused on philosophy of religion. What is it about philosophy and religion in particular that you're particularly drawn to? Oh, right. Uh, well, I'm, um, I'm, I'm based at the Haythorpe College, which is, which is a Jesuit foundation, founded in 1614. Mm. Just had its 400th anniversary actually quite recently um and now is being shut down <laughs> after 400 years um it took it only took five years of conservative government to kill it off so it was it was the it was the, it was the tory educational policies that have done for it it's it had been all all around europe you know it started in belgium it i think it moved to france then it was in um the oxfordshire countryside ended up at the university of london in the 1970s and so on now it's now it's dead uh so that's that gone so now um, that's one reason why I would have an interest in religion. I, I'm at a religious institution. A lot of my colleagues are Jesuits. Um, and you know, we get on very well, actually, for the most part. So there's that. Um, I've also ended up doing more and more for the British Humanist Association, now known as Humanists UK. Uh, Andrew Copson's out there. As I've done more for them, I've become more interested in philosophy of religion. I'm just kind of interested in why people believe really weird things. Um, and religion, as far as I'm concerned, is really quite a weird thing, uh, to believe. Um, so I'm not just in, interested in religion. I'm also interested in, you know, conspiracy theories and wa woo and other wacky belief systems. And I wrote a book called Believing Bullshit, which kind of looks at unusual belief systems in the round and why it is that we're drawn to them and how we, how it is that we end up thinking the way we think in you know in defending those belief systems and religion is just an example of that so i guess that's another reason i got interested in philosophy of religion i suppose another slightly cynical reason maybe i don't know if this occurred to me at the time but um philosophy of religion is quite a small pond so you can become quite a big fish in quite a small pond <laughs> quite easily. And, you know, and how many prominent atheist philosophers of religion very are there? Few, yeah. very, few. very few. It's dominated by the theist. 70% of uh, philosophers of religion are you know, Christian. Mm. Um, so, yeah, so you can quite quickly become notorious <laughs> in philosophy of religion. Um, Prudent for your career. Yeah. On the other hand, 
you're going to find it very difficult to get a job potentially <laughs> uh, in philosophy of religion. Um, I think philosophy of religion is not taken terribly seriously by philosophers more generally, so that might not be a, such a good idea. To, you know, that might not be such a good reason, a, a reason not to go into it. And I think also that you know, well, many jobs in philosophy of religion are you know officially. Only for the religious, you know, you can't hold them unless you're religious. It's the it's the professor of the Christian religion, or you're at a religious institution, or it's religiously funded, and so on. So there is that problem, and then there's also the problem that there is a minority of religious people working in philosophy of religion who will sabotage your career anyway if they can. If you are a prominent atheist, uh, I won't go into details, <laughs> but uh, and they, they may not be entirely doing this in in, in an entirely you know, it may not be clear to them that this is what they're doing very often, mm. uh, but it is what they're doing. Um, they, you know, their their preferred candidate will slip through for one reason or another. Mm. Yeah. Let us pause for a moment and hear a quick message from our sponsors, the New College of the Humanities. Hi, I'm Karishma. I'm studying English literature with creative writing, and I'm in my third year. <laughs> I was actually at the University of York for um, for a term and I decided it wasn't for me because, I mean, there are so many people there. Very large seminar sizes, very large lectures. The thing about NCH is that you get one-on-one -on -one tutorials. You, you get that quality time with your tutor. That time with these brilliant professors, it really does make you better. You feel like you're getting better every week. And I'm quite an introverted person, so it's really, really helpful to, to have a one-on-one -on -one tutorial to actually properly discuss my ideas. We've got the British Museum around the corner. If I'd like to take a break from studying, just to wander around like the Enlightenment Gallery over there or see an exhibition, I can. Before I came to NCH, I wasn't a particularly confident public speaker. But during the professional program, you're you know you're forced to, to get up there with um, with a group, sometimes by yourself. And I've actually become able to communicate my ideas. Whether you're introverted, extroverted, whether you're you know whether you're something in between, um, if you want academic rigor. And if you want professors around who, you know, very intimately know your work and, and know what you need to do better and can give you really good constructive criticism, then in fact, this is, this is the place for you. Liberal arts inspired degrees in the humanities and social sciences. Gold standard teaching with one-to-one -one tutorials and small interactive seminars. Lectures by world-renowned professors, including A.C. Grayling, Daniel C. Dennett, and Steven Pinker. You can still apply directly to NCH London for 2018 entry and be considered for a scholarship. Find out more at nchlondon.ac.uk forward slash pensycast. NCH London, unique degrees for curious minds. Part one, the evil god challenge. So the, I'll start off with the first question, Stephen. Uh, I guess we should start off with the uh, challenge itself. Hmm. Uh, what is the evil god challenge? It's this. We, we, we look at two god hypotheses. The, the, the hypothesis that there's an all-powerful, all-knowing and all-good god and the hypothesis that there's an all-powerful, all-knowing and all-evil god. Almost everyone considers the second hypothesis to be you know, borderline ludicrous. <laughs> uh, it's a highly unreasonable thing for any grown-up to believe. Mm. Um, so the question then is, well, why is belief in a good God um, not just a little bit more reasonable, but very significantly more reasonable? I mean, people who believe in God typically don't say, oh, yeah, it's like believing in fairies or Santa. No, no, it's much more reasonable than that. Even if you can't prove that their God exists, still, you know, it's at least halfway up the scale of reasonableness. It is not, it is, it is, um, not an unreasonable thing to believe that uh, that the three O's God, omnipotent, omniscient, and omnibenevolent God exists. Whereas they do consider the omnipotent, omniscient, and omnimalevolent God mm -hmm. hypothesis to be downright ludicrous. So really, it's the challenge is to explain these very different positions that they give these two God hypotheses on the on the scale of reasonableness. And then you know you can start to sharpen this challenge up a bit by pointing out that many of the most popular arguments for the existence of God turn out not to give us any clue at all really as to God's moral characteristics. Mm -hmm. You know, suppose that there's a first cause or a prime mover 
well, why does it have to be supremely benevolent? <laughs> it doesn't. Um, why, if the universe is designed, does it have to be designed by a supremely benevolent uh, creator? Well, it doesn't. In fact, we've got just as much reason provided by that argument considered in isolation for concluding that it's a supremely malevolent mm -hmm. uh, creator uh, and so on. So although there are some arguments perhaps for a good God, most of the popular arguments, the ones that people tend to trot out mm -hmm. when they're first asked to explain why they believe in God, turn out, on the face of it, uh, at least in their, their simplest versions, to, to, to be completely neutral to between these two God hypotheses. So that's interesting, mm -hmm. isn't it? Why do they then consider one God hypothesis to be so much more reasonable than the other? Um, there are obvious arguments that you can run against um, an evil God. The most obvious is to just point to the abundance of good mm -hmm. that exists in you, the universe. Mm -hmm. I mean, if there's an evil God, why is there so much love, laughter, ice cream, and rainbows? Surely an evil God would not allow us to help each other. Mm. Uh, would clamp down on that sort of behavior straight away because he wants to maximize suffering. Uh, why would an evil God give us beautiful sunsets? Surely he would torture us for eternity with a red hot poker, not give us a lovely view. Why would he give us children to love who love us unconditionally in return? And an evil God would hate love. Clearly this is excellent evidence that there is no evil God. Why do some people have you know, great wealth and health and happiness. David Beckham, for example, seems to have lead, lead a charmed existence. Surely that's very good evidence against an evil god. An evil god would torture David Beckham for all eternity with a red-hot poker and not give him yet another multi-million dollar contract or whatever it happens to be. So uh, maybe that's the reason then. <laughs> but of course, um, there is exactly the same problem when it comes to the good god hypothesis. I mean, you have the problem of evil now to contend with. If you believe in an evil God, you have the problem of good. If you believe in a good God, you have the problem of evil to contend with. There's a great deal of uh, pain and suffering in the universe. Um, there are moral evils, the terrible, morally bad things that we do to each other. We start wars, we kill, we rape, we steal, and so on. Um, and then there are so-called natural evils, the natural diseases and disasters that cause great suffering. And this has been going on for a very long period of time where there are hundreds of millions of years of animal suffering, uh, quite appalling animal suffering before we even showed up. Um, and then when we do show up around about 200,000 years ago, Homo sapiens appears on the scene, um, our children die on an industrial scale. I mean, your chances of making it past your fifth birthday for almost the entire sweep of human history has been not better than you know, not much better than fifty fifty. Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> the, and those children died horribly <laughs> in many cases. Um, you know, they would have died of diseases or genetic defects or malnutrition or whatever. Um, it would have been a slow, lingering, extremely unpleasant death in many cases, and their parents would have had to watch their children die in that way. In many cases, ask any parent what's the worst suffering that they've ever had to endure, and they'll say, that's it, watching your own child die. So this, on the face of it, <laughs> looks like pretty good evidence against the good God. If there's good evidence against the bad God, the evil God, surely there's also abundant evidence against the good God also. Maybe there's some creator of the universe. Maybe there's some intelligence behind it. But surely we can cross these two candidates off our list of likely suspects uh, straight away. Mm -hmm. um, now, of course, in response to the problem of evil, uh, religious people will tend to do one of two things. They'll either cook up explanations for the evil. Mm -hmm. So they may say, well, yes, God allows some people to do evil things. You know, it's sad, but that's the price God has to pay to allow for you know, free will. He could have made us puppet beings that always did the kindly thing, but if you're a puppet being, you're not morally responsible for your actions. And so moral goodness, good deeds done of you know, your own volition, they're not going to exist. Um, mm -hmm. And it's particularly important that they do exist. It's the most important form of goodness. So an evil god, sorry, so a good god, excuse me, will cut our strings, set us free, as a result, some of us will choose to do evil, oh dear, but that's the price paid for the uh, the greater goods. Um, similarly, you can explain um, some e evils as, you know, 
there's some kind of character building mm. program in place. Um, you know, as a parent, I'll watch my daughter repeatedly fall off her bike and graze her knees and there's much crying and there's some blood and so on. And yet I can continue to encourage her back on the bike. No, why? Because at the end of the day, that's the only way that she's going to, you know, get that sense of achievement of having learned to ride her bike. That's the only way she's going to be able to learn to ride her bike and so on. So it may be then that some of the suffering that we go through in this life is there to help us grow and develop morally mm-hmm. and spiritually. It's a sort of no pain, no gain. Mm-hmm theodicy or explanation which you could offer and then there are loads of other explanations mm. too and if you, and if you find these a bit thin uh inadequate these explanations you can always also play the skeptical theist card so uh What's the, the skeptical, uh, the theist, skeptical card? theist says that they're a theist who uh-huh. gets skeptical about our ability to know what reasons god might have for doing mm. things so they say look you're just a human being you have a very limited ability to discern what reasons God might have, you know, if he exists Mm -hmm. for doing various things, just because you can't think of a reason why God would kill children on an industrial scale over 200,000 years, doesn't mean that there isn't a reason back Mm -hmm. there. There could easily be such a reason. And so you're not in any position to know. So while you know that there are evils, you don't know that any of them are unjustified, that they are, Mm -hmm. you know, to use the the jargon, gratuitous Mm -hmm. evils. And it's only gratuitous evils that are a problem so far as, you know, traditional theism is concerned. So, you know, you can do that. You can, we've looked at a couple of theodicies or explanations for for the evil. And then you can say that, well, even if I can't explain the evil, so what? You know, you wouldn't expect me to. I mean, there could easily be good reasons for this evil, even if I can't think of it, them. So, uh, so maybe that tips the balance then towards a good God and away from an evil God. The problem, of course, is that it doesn't because you can then run much the same kind of moves in yeah. defense of an evil god so you can say well why why are some people allowed to help others evil god hates that he wants to maximize suffering mm-hmm. right well he could have made us puppet beings that always did the mm-hmm. malevolent thing but if you're a puppet being you're not morally responsible for what you do and so moral evil will not exist in the universe mm-hmm. therefore evil god in order to get the worst kinds of evil is going to have to cut our strings and set us free As a result, some of us then choose to do good. Oh dear, but that's the price evil God pays Mm -hmm. for the very great evil of moral evil existing in the universe. So you can see that we've flipped the first theodicy or explanation there. And once you've seen that you can flip that one, it occurs to you that probably you can flip many of the others too. So, um, you know, this isn't a veil of soul making or character Mm -hmm. building. This is a veil of soul destruction. Mm -hmm. Uh, Why does an evil God put some good into the universe some beauty say well to make our appreciation of the ugliness and dreariness of day-to-day life all the more acute why does he give people healthy young bodies well just for a short time so he can take them away again it's so much more cruel to uh give some someone something wonderful and then remove it than to have never given it to them in the first place uh why does david beckham get all that lovely stuff to make the rest of us feel bad there are certain (laughs) second order evils which are not available without certain first order goods some people have to have good stuff in order for you to feel jealous and yeah. resentful and so on uh and then if you don't like those explanations well i can just play the skeptical right. theist card i can say just because you can't think of reasons why an evil god would uh, allow these goods gives you no grounds whatsoever for thinking that there are no such reasons mm-hmm. so you don't know that any of the goods are gratuitous from an evil god's perspective mm-hmm. so you can see that there's a kind of symmetry becoming apparent here between these two god hypotheses when we look at the arguments for god we find that you know certainly amongst the most popular arguments they 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 tend not to favor one god hypothesis over the other at least Mm -hmm. not not considered in isolation um yes both god hypotheses face an empirical challenge there seems on the face of it to be evidence against their existence in each Mm -hmm. case but on the other hand you know you can use theodicies you can cook up explanations for the evils or the goods in each case And again, you can play the sceptical theist card pretty effectively, it seems, in each case. So why is one of these God hypotheses significantly more reasonable than the other is the challenge that I'm sort of articulating here. And I personally can't see that there is a good Mm -hmm. answer here. Um, It has to be significantly more reasonable. That's important as well. It is important, yeah. I mean, you know, one God hypothesis might be slightly more reasonable than the other, and yet they could both be downright ludicrous. I mean, if if one of them is downright ludicrous, pointing out that the other one is very slightly more reasonable is hardly 
good enough if you want to show that the other belief is actually by no means unreasonable. So, so yeah, so it's, it's going to have to be some significant asymmetry that's established, um, here. And so that's the challenge. And I suppose that one of the things I'm doing here is I'm trying to get theists who habitually appeal to theodicies and explanations for evil and skeptical theism to see that the strategy that they're employing there is one that they would consider pretty ludicrous mm. <laughs> if it, if 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 it were employed in defense of belief in an evil god um i'm trying to get that penny to drop um often if you've spent a long period of time engaged in a certain kind of intellectual activity mm -hmm. that actually is pretty flaky but you know everyone else that you know is doing it and everyone's saying yeah this is the way to go it, it can be hard for you to see that actually there is something fundamentally dodgy about the way that you're thinking mm. and approaching the issue um and so th the point of this analogy in part is just to get people to see things from a slightly different angle so they can just step out of their own skin for a moment and see how what they're doing looks from another perspective <laughs> indeed they themselves would be very skeptical about yeah. this kind of activity were it were it engaged in by a defender of belief in an evil god that's part of what i'm doing i guess sometimes if you if you're trying to challenge a belief system and you actually you want to persuade people bring them on board if you come at them straight ahead as it were um it can be very difficult trying to convince a young earth creationist that they're wrong, yeah. you are going to find it very, very difficult because they have, uh, they can draw on an enormous range of arguments and challenges and maneuvers in defense of what they believe. Um, and they'll be firing off mysteries at you left, right and center that you'll probably struggle with unless you happen to be an expert in this particular mm -hmm. branch of mm -hmm. science or whatever it might happen to be. Um, you're going to get out of depth very, very quickly. So they're ready for you when it comes to a frontal attack. They have extremely good defenses. Anyone in the audience watching the interaction between the two of you mm -hmm. is very, is likely to come away with the impression that, ooh, you know, they've, they've, that, that, you know, you have actually really struggled uh, yeah. to show that they're wrong. Uh, there might be something to this then, right? On the other hand, if your strategy is not to go at the young earth creationist head on, but to sneak around the back, and point out that the strategies that they are employing, the intellectual maneuvers that they're engaging in, when they're engaged in by those people over there, <laughs> they can see and they themselves condemn them as, you know, ludicrous, as pseudo profundity, as poor argument and, and so on. They can see that what those people over there are doing is ridiculous, <laughs> um, is rationally speaking, uh, you know, to be condemned. And if you can then point out that actually they're engaging in the same strategies, basically, that there is no very obvious difference between the two, then I think you've probably got a far better chance of shifting their opinion. Mm. And really that's, I guess, what I'm trying to do with the Evil God Challenge. I'm trying to get them to see that what they're doing here, if it was done elsewhere, they they wouldn't find they wouldn't stand for it yeah just to uh, recap for our list before we move on to the next question and correct me if i go wrong anywhere here Stephen. so we've got the good god hypothesis which is god is omnipotent omniscient and all good and the evil god hypothesis which is omnipotent omniscient yet all evil when we challenge the evil god hypothesis with the problem of good and we're looking explicitly at the evidential problem of good here so there's a vast amount of good and this shows it's highly unlikely to be true. We can defend this through evil god theodicies, i.e. they're the reverse of good god theodicies, which are used to respond to the evidential problem of evil. In your 2010 paper, at the end, you conclude, Now I do not claim that the symmetry thesis is true, i.e. the thesis that both are equally as reasonable, and the theist has to... Um, sorry, I'm, I'm coming off the quote here. So... The symmetry thesis being that both are equally as reasonable and the theist has to show why the good God hypothesis is significantly more reasonable. I'll continue your quote here. And that the evil God challenge cannot be met, but it seems to me that the challenge that it deserves to be taken seriously. So here you've the conclusion is it's a very strong challenge 
it might be able to be met. I do believe you you mentioned that uh, a moral argument of some kind might be the best way of, of solving this challenge. Maybe, yeah. In 2016, uh, quoting from yeah, the Forum of European Philosophy, you conclude, I call this the evil God challenge, and I don't believe that it can be met. Does this mean that you, your opinion of the strength of the challenge has changed in, between, mm. in those six years? Not really. I think I, think I believed that, um, well, I did believe that it couldn't be met, it very probably couldn't be met earlier on, back in 2010. Mm. Um, but I'm just acknowledging, I was acknowledging the possibility that it could. Mm. You know, I hadn't. You know, I hadn't spent a very, very long t- period of time thinking about it, and it might be that there was you know, something would show up. And even now, you know, I accept that. So, you know, it may be that the challenge can be met in some way. Um, but currently, I don't believe that it can. I've not yet found an adequate response mm-hmm. to it. Okay. So, I think I've. I don't think I've changed my mind. In 1968, uh, Madden Hare published uh, a similar challenge to this in Evil and the Concept of God. And as you know, Stephen Kahn and Christopher New, who you reference in your Evil God challenge, also propose similar challenges. What makes your challenge different from these previous challenges? Yeah, well, I kind of go into it in a lot more detail <laughs> um, and really unpack it in in some depth. I think Madden and Hare sort of mention it in passing. Mm. Kahn, Kahn does, um, I think, I explore it in a bit more detail. Um, some of them actually, so I think Christopher knew, wasn't it, that, um, thought that actually there was, um, um, is there an exact, uh, yeah, of each theodicy? Yeah. And it seems to me that, that there's unlikely to be an exact, so well, most of them actually seem to think that there's an exact parallel mm. between these two, it, so far as, you know, the, the reasonableness of these two hypotheses is, is concerned. Mm. And, um, I don't take that line. It seems to me that they it might be that one hypothesis is a bit more likely than the other. You know, maybe that the belief that there's fairies at the bottom of the garden is slightly more reasonable than the belief that Santa delivers presents on Christmas Day, but still they're both highly unreasonable. Mm. Um, it seems to me that, you know, if you're going to reject belief in an evil god on the basis of observation of the world around you, and I think you very probably should, um, then for much the same reasons, then you should be rejecting belief in a good god on the basis of observation of the world. So there are, some, are there any things which can't be mirrored then from on the evil gods defenders account from the good Oh, I see. Yes. So um, I think certain theodicies or explanations for evil don't obviously flip. And in my paper, um, I mentioned one. So the fall, the appeal to the fall. So, you know, there was Adam and Eve mm. and everything was great. Uh, there was no pain or death. Uh, but then they sinned and um, that corrupted not only themselves, it corrupted nature. So you can try and explain not only the natural evils, sorry, the moral evils, but also the natural evils by appealing to the sin of Adam and Eve. So that's the fall then. It's a catastrophe for both human beings and the, the world that they inhabit. Mm. Uh, that's an explanation for evil. Mm. Um, it's very difficult to see how you would, produce a mirror explanation for you know in defense of belief in a, 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 an evil god you know how you could explain the good mm. by means of some sort of reverse fall you know i had a go i don't see how you can do it it doesn't seem to make any sort of narrative sense mm. so it may be that some um theodicies and explanations just don't flip um but you know that doesn't much change my opinion as to the overall situation here because this particular explanation was always one of the worst i mean you know there was no adam and eve for a start uh you know the fall is a myth it never Mm. happened and so on um so yeah so there is an asymmetry there um and then it might be that there are possibly some uh asymmetries the other way it might be that that that, that actually that you can make a slightly better case maybe for or in defense of belief in an evil god than for or in defense of belief in the good God. So, for example, it's tempting to think when it comes to an evil God that there's sort of, you don't get, you know, traditions, religious traditions appealing to an evil God. You don't get scripture. You don't get religious experience. People don't claim to have experienced an evil God. Um, nor do there appear to be sort of evil miracles. Um, so, on the other, but on the other hand, you know, when people pray to the good God, well, people get better. Mm. Uh, there are miracles 
there are religious experiences, there are you know, scripture and there's tradition and so on. All of this, you might think, significantly tips the balance in the direction of the good God over the evil God. However, maybe not, um, because if I was an evil God, I might not want you to know that I was an evil God. I might want to engage in deception. Probably would, wouldn't I, mm -hmm. being an evil God? Mm -hmm. So... Uh, Here's what I might do. I might go to the, you know, these people over there and I'll, I can do the miracles because I am a god after all. Um, and I'll put on the white outfit with the halo before I appear to them in religious experiences. So they'll think I'm a good god. Mm -hmm. I'll tell them I'm a good god. Um, and I will then tell them some stuff. I'll then go to another group of people. I'll, again, I'll do the miracles. I'll appear to them in religious experiences as a good god. And I'll tell them some stuff that contradicts what I told the first bunch of people. Now, that would be a recipe for a great deal of evil, wouldn't it? Because each of these two groups now thinks that they have the one true God on their side and they're going to go at the other group with a ferocity uh, that simply wouldn't be possible unless they knew that they were doing God's bidding, uh, that they had the one true God on their side and indeed that they would be going to heaven uh, when they died in, you know, in, in defense of their beliefs. So if you now look at how religious experiences and miracles and traditions are distributed around the globe, well, that's just exactly how they are distributed around the globe. So, uh, you know, the religious conflict mm. is a major, major source of uh, uh, evil Absolutely. across the face of the, of the globe. So it seems to me then that possibly religious experience, miracles, and the existence of these traditions is better evidence for an evil God than it is for a good God. You actually get a better fit. As far as the evidence is concerned. So maybe, maybe that tips the balance in the direction of an evil god a little bit. But of course, it would be ludicrous for me to conclude that that makes it reasonable to believe in an evil god. It clearly is not reasonable to believe in an evil god. So, you know, even if there are these minor asymmetries, mm. it doesn't really matter very much to the symmetry thesis as I understand it, because the symmetry thesis is the, is the claim that these two beliefs are more or less mm -hmm. equal. Um, there may be some slight difference, just how reasonable each one is compared to the other, but no, they are more or less equal. So if one is very low on the scale of reasonableness, and the evil good hypothesis surely is, then the other one, it seems, must be low on the scale of reasonableness too. Okay, so um, linking back to the question, so that's what distinguishes your argument from the previous arguments. I think it is Christopher New who he talks about anti-miracles, doesn't he, and talks about, um, he, and he's making the claim that they're identically reversible. So when we have anti-miracles or anti-religious experiences or uh, cultures with competing ideas of the one true God, and that seems to favour an evil God and, and supports the symmetry thesis, and, and that's fine, I buy this, this section of the argument. The first point on a reversed fall, I'm, I'm not sure how this, how a reversed fall is incompatible and I, can I have a go at, go on, have at a get, go. trying to get, give an account? Maybe I just didn't try hard enough. Yeah. If, if you have an evil God, yeah. and so let's start off with the good God. Good God uh, creates the world perfect. If you say everything's fantastic, rainbows, butterflies, all the rest of it, no evil. Hmm. Uh, the fall, and then evil enters the world. Why does evil enter the world, good God? Well, it'll help your soul building. It'll, it'll make you a better person. It'll help you grow. And what else can we appeal to? So that's that soul built, uh, character building. Second order. Evil. Second order evil. Second order goods. For, first, first order hmm. evils. So we need evils like hurricanes. I need my brother to be in pain and in need so I can give to him charitably. Good God says, this is why I've allowed for the fall. Now, evil God, why would you allow good to enter the world? Well, it seems that mm -hmm. allowing your soul to be destroyed from the hurricane, that, that's better. That, that fulfills my plan. And we need second order First order goods to have second order evils. You need Greg to have lots of money and David Beckham to have a lovely life so he can have it all taken away from him at the end of it or something like this. Or so we can suffer when we see this happening. Hmm. So when we plug in the theodicies reverse <laughs> either way, does it not give a, does it not give us a nice narrative? You can do, yeah, you can, you can mirror some of it, but then there are other bits that, you know, like a reverse Satan, for example, you know, that, that tempts somebody away. Um, and, you know, the, how, how do we weave that in? It's not obvious how you do that and get a good narrative out of it. That's what I was thinking about, really. Mm -hmm. And also, um, if reverse Satan is good, then him allowing good into the world, it fits the reverse narrative, doesn't it? And we can see how that would play out. But if Satan is evil still and uh, with evil God, 
Why would he defy evil God and fulfill his evil plan and bring good into the world? Well, the answer is just the same as the first, is it not? You have, it's to bring more suffering into the world. Ultimately, the mm. telos of the world is evil. This just goes towards that end or purpose. So, so there's, uh, we have Adam, uh, sort of reverse Adam and Eve, as mm. it were, who, 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 who start doing good because, give, because they've been given free will. And you're, you're suggesting that, as I suggested, that even an evil god might allow mm. that, given it's the price paid for greater moral evils. Yeah. So that all of that that bit certainly flips. I find yeah. I agree with you. Yeah. I, I, I str- I've it's, thought about it for a long time. We had yeah. a mass. We probably had a four or five hour long conversation about this. Where I took <laughs> yeah. your view, and right. Greg pulled me around to okay. thinking the opposite. Yeah. Well, maybe you can pull me around. You're on welcome. This. <laughs> but I buy the asymmetry completely on the side that we have evidence in favour of an evil god from from the appeal we made to New on on anti miracles. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, in cultures. Yeah, uh, I uh, yeah. A little while ago, I had a thought of uh, that, that. I thought I'd spotted some something that wasn't going to flip, but now I've forgotten it, so I can't. So I'm afraid it's, it's gone. Maybe it will come back to me later, and I'll email it to you or something. Mm-hmm. But but yeah, it, you know, maybe you're right. Uh, maybe you'll bring me around on this. Let us pause once again to hear from our fantastic sponsors, the New College of the Humanities. You can find the link to the New College of the Humanities on our website as well as in the iTunes description. My name is Rob Howell. I'm a History with English student and I'm going into my final year at NCH. I'm 42 years old and I spent 20 years working in banking and asset management. NCH was a far more human institution than any other that I encountered because it's accessible. The academics here um, are are rigorous but sympathetic to the struggles that people have. It is an institution with um, a human face and, and humanist principles. Coming here I was really apprehensive about my capacity to, to make the intellectual cut and I'm really glad that the tutors here saw something in me which I didn't believe I had which has proven to be a source of inspiration and endless fascination. And it's definitely something that I will be taking with me after I leave NCH. You can still apply directly or through UCAS to NCH London for 2018 entry and be considered for a scholarship worth up to £2,000 per year. Find out more at nchlondon.ac.uk forward slash pansycast. NCH London. Unique degrees for curious minds. Okay, let's head back over to the discussion. This idea of a truly evil being, the criticism which is often given to the evil god argument is something like this. Um, is it evil beings don't seem to be possible? It seems impossible for have something that's truly evil, i.e. I can imagine a frequent evildoer. I can think of Tony Soprano from The Sopranos. He's always evil. He seems like he does a lot of evil acts. Or think of Walter White in Breaking Bad. He does lots of evil. If you saw him, you'd say he was evil. But he does lots of loving things too. Sometimes they do things for the sake of their families. They do things for the greater good as they see it in their skewed logic to bring about a better state of affairs for Hmm. themselves. So they're always aligned with the good in some sense. But how about this truly evil character? This person who's always aligned with evil, even though they seem to do good things, i.e. bring about a world with rainbows, butterflies, and make it great for David Beckham. Is it is it really possible for someone to always be aligned with evil? Is this, this, hmm. this the criticism, I guess, is, is it impossible to be truly evil? That's a good question. Fully and truly evil, yeah. Is, yeah, that's a good question. Um, and the answer, the answer might be no. Maybe there's some kind of logical problem with the very idea of an evil god. I mean, after all, some people think there's a logical problem with the very idea of a good God. They say that, you know, the various attributes simply can't be consistently combined. The very idea of an omnipotent being makes no sense and so on. So, you know, there's obviously a long tradition of pursuing those kind of objections. And it may be that you can pursue those kind of objections when it comes to an evil God, possibly even with more success. I don't know. So this is a huge can of worms that we're opening here. Um, however, right, um, here's Here's the thing. Even if you could establish that there is some kind of logical problem when it comes to an evil god, there's some sort of logical contradiction involved there for whatever reason. Um, if it's nevertheless true that you would reject belief in an evil god anyway, setting aside the logical problem, if you would, if you would reject belief in an evil god anyway on the basis of observation of the world around you, 
then you should, to be consistent, reject belief in a good God on the basis of observed goods when it comes to the you know, observation of the world around you. You know, you, the, the evil challenge, God challenge can still be run in that form, um, even if it turned out that there was some logical problem with the very idea of an evil God. So it doesn't really, I think I even point this out in the paper, that doesn't really deal with the challenge. Mm. Uh, it's an interesting little aside <laughs> that we yeah. can pursue, mm. but the fundamental issue that I'm pressing here is if, if, as we surely should reject belief in an evil God on the basis of what we see of the world around us, then we should reject the good God hypothesis on the very same basis. If you're pointing out to me that there's another reason to reject an evil God as well, namely the very idea involves a logical contradiction, well, fine, maybe we can argue about that, but it's kind of irrelevant as far as the, um, the challenges I, as I just set it up. Can we run the argument with a morally neutral God? So we obviously having a neutral God is we have neutral people who aren't good or evil. Can is could we run it as in the good God hypothesis against the neutral God hypothesis? Well, if you're if you believe in a, an, a you can deal with the, the evidential problem of evil as it's known by just crossing off any one of the three omni attributes you know, okay. off the list, can't you? You say, you know, if he if he's not all good, well then there's no problem. If he's not all knowing, there's no problem because, you know, he could have the power to prevent the evils and he would desire that the evils not be there, but oh dear, he doesn't know about them. So that's why they're there. So so you cross any one of the omni attributes off the list and there is no problem of evil. Similarly, cross any one of the omni attributes of the evil god, you know, omnipotence, omnipotence, omniscience and omni malevolence lose any one of those and there's no problem anymore so a new a morally neutral god that is all omnipotent and omniscient but you know couldn't care less one way or the other or lacks moral attributes or whatever we we, we have not uh crossed that one off our list of candidate gods here the the question why does the universe exist is a very good question you know maybe you're going to need some sort of god in order to explain it, I rather doubt it. But let's suppose for the sake of argument that that was true. Still, we can quite reasonably rule out an evil God on the basis of observation. And if that's true, why can't we rule out a good God on the basis of observation? It seems to me that we probably can. So I guess we'll finish up on this last question before we're moving on to uh, part two. But Stephen, the last question we have is, uh, it's, uh, I guess it's an objection that sometimes are raised. So we talk a lot in metaphysics about parsimony and parsimony simply stated is that we should um, appeal to the simplest uh, explanation of any given set of explanations. Uh, and often people say that, well, surely an, the evil God hypothesis is much more complex than the uh, good God hypothesis. And therefore, by considerations of parsimony, we should uh, appeal to the uh, good God explanation for the distribution of uh, good and evil in the world mm. rather than the evil god well of course you'd have to come up with an argument for why the good god hypothesis was uh the more economical mm -hmm. hypothesis but let's suppose you could do that um <clears throat> it wouldn't really um significantly break the asymmetry it seems to me so for so you know if i believe that you know well, here are two beliefs one is that um there are a thousand elves uh, living secretly in Swindon. Mm -hmm. And then another hypothesis, there are a thousand elves, each with a thousand fairies living in his hat, uh, living in Swindon. Now, one of those hypotheses is, is considerably simpler than the other one. Um, and yet, you know, they're both clearly ludicrous. Mm -hmm. um, so the mere fact that one hypothesis is simpler than another does not, given that one of them is downright absurd, doesn't doesn't give us much reason to prefer the other one. Mm -hmm. um, particularly when there are so many other options on the table. I mean, we could just go for a god that's, you know, neither good or good nor all evil. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, so I, I, I acknowledge that there might be an asymmetry in terms of parsimony. Uh, there might be an asymmetry in terms of there being some kind of logical problem. But nevertheless, I think that this, the, the challenge really still stands. Mm. We haven't actually really yet dealt properly with the challenge. We're just tinkering around the edges. The fundamental problem uh, remains that if you are justified in rejecting belief in an evil god on the basis of observed goods in the universe, mm. then why are you not justified in rejecting a good god on the basis of the observed evils?
So the conclusion of the evil god challenge is that the theists hold an unreasonable view. So at the start we said they consider it to be reasonable, but they flippantly dismiss the evil god hypothesis. They should do the same for the good god hypothesis. So their faith is perhaps grounded in a Kierkegaardian leap of faith, but it isn't grounded in reason alone. Is that the is that the conclusion of the criticism? Well, it's I guess it's if if it's reasonable to reject belief in an evil god on the basis of what we observe of the universe and i think it probably is reasonable to do that then why isn't it reasonable to reject belief in the good god on the basis of much the same kind of observation there are various moves that you can make here um we've looked at one or two but there are, there are lots more but that's the fundamental question i think that i'm that i'm pressing here yeah <laughs> Thank you for joining us for another episode of the Pan Psycast. The next instalment of this episode will be available next Monday. For all the reading and to find out more about the show, you can visit www.thepansycast.com, the link to which can be found in the iTunes description. Most importantly, thank you to everybody who has left us a review on the iTunes store. If you haven't done so, please go and do so now. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. It's been lots of fun. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Thank you all. I've enjoyed it a lot. Thank you. Goodbye. I really appreciate what you folks are trying to do, bringing philosophy to that savage land of England. (laughs) That was good. You guys uh, managed to combine the banter and the philosophy perfectly, I think. Beautiful. Fantastic. Oh, well done, you guys. Gosh, you're doing a wonderful thing with this. (laughs)